This morning, I explained to, uh, to a number of shocked people who were fans of distinguished professor Charles L. Owen that he passed away last night. So I'd like you to know that as a tribute to Mary Owen, his, uh, his, his beloved wife and now widow, um, we are live streaming this portion of the, of the event so that Mary can hear from, uh, from Dr. Bazzara and from John Pippineau uh, the ways in which we're trying to honor our great friend and, and, um, and, and gifted and distinguished professor for four decades here at the Institute of Design, Dr. Charles L. Owen. Before I turn the stage over to uh, Dr. Bazzara, who was the last PhD student that Charles L. Owen personally coached through his work, I just want to put systems thinking here at the Institute of Design into a little tiny bit of context. One of the first things we tell all students is that when they get a design problem they're supposed to solve, they need to think of it at two levels. One level is what's the problem, and the other level is actually more important. It's the question that you should always ask. When in the course of human events have human beings ever encountered a problem like this, of this level of complexity, of this level of sophistication? About how many factors am I going to have to nail in order to have a reasonable, thorough understanding of this problem? And what we tried to do is to give every student at the Institute of Design the ability to swiftly and with discipline mentally sort any problem that they encounter into the right bucket of how tough this problem is. And in general, the buckets go like this. If there's 12 or fewer factors, then you can pretty much nail it on the back of an envelope if you know how to do it. We call that a Doblin sort. If the problem has between, say, for instance, 10 and 50 factors, you need much more special weapons and tactics. And Vijay Kumar, uh, here with us now, and generally considered to be the world's leading expert in design methods, has created the world's best methods for that class of problems, symmetric and asymmetric sorting matrices that can help you to break the problem down into its constituent parts and pieces. But then there's this whole other class of problems that have more than 50 simultaneous factors and maybe as many as 400 simultaneous factors. Think about, for instance, designing a space shuttle or a nuclear-powered submarine or the entire surgical operating theater complex inside of a major university-based hospital system. These are tough problems, problems that don't allow themselves, as we learned from Professor Irwin, to be solved by any group of people, however talented, unless they use special approaches. The two most respected approaches in the world are one that emanated from the former Soviet Union, which is called TRIZ, T-R-I-Z, and the other is called Structured Planning, which was personally built and pioneered over three and a half decades by Dr. Charles L. Owen. Now, for those of you that have never heard of either structured planning or trees, you, you want to make sure you know about it. Because literally, as we've learned from Terry, the odds of us having any chance of solving a problem like climate change in the time that we have, uh, which I think is about negative 10 years, um, without using these kinds of event methodologies is zero. Now, the people that love trees are often from you know, sort of the Soviet-era countries, and there's a good reason. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the way it works in the former Soviet bloc is that if uh, some of you had designed, let's say, a bridge, and that bridge ever fell down, well, the Soviet authorities would come and find you and your team, and they would bring you to the rubble where the bridge collapsed, and they would line you up in front of it, and they would shoot you. And as a result, engineers in the former Soviet countries really were quite keen on learning how to do things that would actually function. You know, they wanted to build bridges that would stay up instead of fall down. And so that's one of the reasons why there was such an enormous demand around the world for mastering trees. 
Here in this part of the world, structured planning has a bit more momentum, all because one guy just kept asking the question, how do we break down the really tough problems and solve them for real? And nobody has a better take on that, really, than two guys in this room, Dr. Bazzara and B.J. Kumar, um, and we are lucky to have both of them in the room, but I'm going to turn it over first to you, Charles, if you could give us a little sense of how Chuck Owen challenged you and changed your life. I think it would be a gift to all of us, especially on this particular day. Yeah. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Um, it's a very tough uh, day. I lost my mentor last night, and, uh, but I, I think the the best way to honor him is going forward and sharing ideas and talking about the future, talking about ideas optimistically and, and think, and, and, and that's my goal. Um, I, 20 years ago, I graduated in this institution with the uh, title of PhD. Chuck was my advisor. I will tell you a, a little bit about this story. After that, I went to academic environment, I went to corporate environment, I was uh, traveling to, in technology, working in, in Latin America, I was a lecturer in New Zealand, so I always, I have a, an interesting career in consulting, and uh, that part is still, I'm in the board of some companies, I have a, an interesting career, and all this, Chuck had a big impact in my, in this experience in my life, intellectually, I also continued this curiosity uh, that he inspired me in, in this pot potential. And I, I studied after my PhD, I saw how ignorant I was in many things, and I still am. And uh, you just discover how, li how little you know and how much you don't know in this process. But uh, very humble process. So I spent 10 years studying uh, philosophy of science and quantum physics, so I kept, and I'm still uh, the same type of student. So I got to a point where I don't know now, I don't know what I am anymore, I don't know what I do, and I cannot explain what I do, and I cannot show what I have done because it's confidential for cooperation. It's the best, uh, terrible marketing, but that's, that's been my life. I'm not in the academia anymore, in the universities. I'm working for corporations and com companies helping them to transform and, and hack uh, complex, very complex systems. Um, I was, so come with, uh, in this talk, I want to be brief, I want to interact with you. Uh, I would like to talk with you, not just for you. Uh, and I was looking for an image and uh, to talk about this towards the whole, this movement of seeing the big picture and how can we, we engage in this movement. Um, so I was looking for a, an image, and I think the, the image that I want to, 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 to share, because I, I don't want to convince anyone of anything, uh, I just want to, to share some ideas of the testimony. I, I was thinking the, the resonance, the wave that I want to, the ripple that I want to, to suggest has three elements in my talk. First is the mindset which means the, the world view, the way of thinking, and many people, many other presentations uh, talked about that as well. The second part, behaviors, attitudes, the interaction between what happened between us, and last, praxis. And by this, I mean methods, tools, and uh, I think we, we talk about a lot about this. So these three elements is, will be I'll be trying to navigate in these three layers, as I say, and, uh, but a little bit more complex than that. I also want to add things. Uh, I will not only talk about the past, and I want to do an overview of what uh, Chuck has done and about his methodology, his structured planning, but I also want to, to talk about the future, to the present, the, what's exciting, some ideas, some concepts, because uh, he... he to, to really honor him is to talk about the future because he always talk about the future very optimistically. Um, so there are more layers here. I want to make this also what's, what I'm doing with this gift that I received and how I can see a little bit in the future. 
So I'm talking about the past, the present, and the future as well. And because of my Brazilian ac accent, it's not that simple. It would be even more complicated than that to be more like this, the image that I want to, to give to you. So that come with me uh, in this. That's the picture that I, I'd like to navigate. It's like a, a matrix. I'd like to start in the, when ideas begin, I think very important with this picture in the art and this fresco from Raphael. It's called the School of Athens. And there we see, we see many characters. We see Plato pointing to the heavens, Aristotle pointing to the ground, this great guy, Socrates, um, persuading people and telling people that every person has a sun, just let them shine. And, uh, and he was exercising a very interesting method, much more sophisticated than design thinking, agile, or any other method that you can imagine. This very old, very efficient method, which is uh, recognize your ignorance, ask good questions, reflect, provoke, reflect, and learn. So that's a little bit what I, I'd like to do. Uh, then you have other, other characters here, the, the mathematicians, the, the solitude of some thinkers, uh, and, and as you, as you can see here in more detail. So uh, now you can see uh, the, the conversation. And, and I think Larry talked about this space, but there is something that I like about this space, is where the presenter is, is below the audience. I think that comes from the Greek theater, and I think that's very humble as well. And I would say Socrates would like that as well. Well. These guys, the Greek, were, I think, the first to really start to figure out, seeing the power of the mind and trying to understand uh, complex systems. And they came up with a very interesting concept that I would like to start here. First, they said, look, there is something which is the brick, the matter, the substance, where I can measure, and where the movement is quantification. I want to quantify that. But also, in another extreme, there is the house, where there is order, there is a relationship between the bricks, where emerges a pattern, where I want to quanti qualify. So these are very interesting. One movement, very interesting measuring things and quantify things, and another one of, of qualifying and understanding the relationships of them. Okay, the. Uh, the Romans came, and they were very much in the first step. They were pragmatics, as they called themselves. And they saw this knowledge from the Greeks, and they said, look, anything that is useful for building bridges and arms, it stays. The other stuff, just burn or get out of here. So some of those knowledge, the other knowledge that was not useful for war, uh, escaped and from some people to Middle East. And, uh, well, when they, the Roman Empire really needed to deal with complexity, with logistic, and understanding systems, complex systems, they couldn't. There was a moment that they couldn't handle the level of complexity. They couldn't understand the order and the relationships between things, and they failed. Uh, the knowledge that uh, was hidden in the Middle East came back to Europe after that, and... Uh, was useful to, to be part of the creation of uh, Renaissance. So all the, all the relationship, understanding the patterns was useful. The qualification aspect was back to the, to the agenda. One guy who really understood that track, the stream, was Chuck Owen. This is a picture at uh, Otago. I was in New Zealand and I invited Chuck to come and he came with Mary and uh, in the paper of the city, like first page of the paper, he said this, the trick to the whole thing is dealing with complexity. We need to work with a lot of information and put it in a form where we can process it. So his goal, he worked, like Larry said, 35 years trying to, to refine this process of dealing with large scale, large information. I want to briefly show you an overview of his 
method in his life, but very briefly, to understand using his decomposition, his structure, uh, a little bit about education, about his experience, some awards, some behaviors, and talk a, a very quick overview on structured pain. Very quick. First, education. So he was a chemistry uh, bachelor. Uh, he studied at, uh, at ID, the master's program and other, other programs, and he started teaching in 65 uh, here at ID. He was a former Navy uh, official, and then uh, so he, he, he has the ex military experience who gave him a lot of disciplines and some of the, the information you can see here. Uh, Chuck was also a consultant to many companies. Here are some companies uh, that he was a, a consultant. He, he won very rec international recognition, many prizes. I say if, if there was a Nobel Prize in design or innovation, Chuck would be the equivalent of Niels Bohr for physics, or something like this. So he'll be uh, one of the founders, the, the real. Uh, so, yeah. This uh, influence of Chuck and this discipline helped to make this university, this school, very famous. And they, they really were the best. Look at the date of this news uh, journal, uh, 86, I think, uh, and 89, right? 89. Uh, and, and he, in that time, he was worried about, this is a project about global warming. So he was way ahead of his time in terms of worries and, and challenges that uh, we should dedicate our, our minds. So, um, yeah, let's, let's talk about more about Chuck. Uh, discipline, precision, the love of precision, extreme curiosity. Chuck was like a, a, a kid, like a child, always asking questions or never complaining about anything. Uh, very humble, very humble, very constructive, right, in the interactions, any criticism, never always optimistic, and he was truly a mentor. He was very advanced in, in, the, in the methods and the systems. He, uh, for example, to evaluate people, to give the grades of, of some classes, he used to run these type of forms where he can see how you self-evaluate, uh, how you, uh, the self-evaluation, and also how your peers in the teams evaluate yourself. And he would combine this, and by hand, in, each, in the back of each of those forms, he would write, a feedback for you. And we were like waiting this because every class we were like, well, what are you going to say after uh, this, this term, this uh, period? So we were always looking about, uh, for, for this uh, writing, his handwriting uh, as a feedback, a constructive feedback for each one of us. He was a connoisseur of seashells. I don't know if for those close friends know, he knew everyone by heart and, and the pattern and he, the nature, how it was built, where it comes from. He was, was usually giving class, giving lecture about this, and uh, he was really a truly connoisseur. The journal, Design Process Newsletter, that he was uh, 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 directing uh, during many years, was way ahead. The topics, I really, I, I'm not in the academic environment to close right now, but uh, the topics, the articles there, I don't see, it's hard to find today. They were the type of deepness, the scientific uh, discipline, and the, the, the inspirational of the art, those articles were incredible, just incredible. Um, so, and truly a mentor. And um, by mentor, I mean, uh, someone that sees something in you that you haven't seen yet. It's amazing. So after inviting him to New Zealand, he, he came, comes back and he writes me a note. And he said, look, we know you'll be very successful in the, in the bottom. He, and it's like to hear this from your mentor, it's something that uh, is like saying, I, I'm with you and uh, I know you'll be you, you're in the right track. It's, it's, that's what it means to be a mentor for me. Um, 35 years Chuck dedicated to structured planning um, to help 
a process to create this process to developing concepts in a holistic system. He was inspired in the beginning by Christopher Alexander, and this book of Christopher Alexander is amazing, The Notes of the Cities of Form. And uh, the ideas, we have to understand the, the context. Uh, computing was not that strong yet in this time. This book was published in 64, but influence, influenced a lot of Chuck's uh, thinking. And based on graph uh, theory for mathematics, all the systemization, deductive logic, using deductive logic to, to create creativity to architecture uh, and design. Uh, also the idea of idea network and combining ideas and concepts, the idea of decomposition, breaking things in parts and understanding the system, diagramming, programming was beginning but still very limited by the time, and also uh, the pattern language that Christopher Alexander. But Christopher Alexander, um, how to say it, he, he moved back, he, he, he gave up this effort and Chuck continued. He continued. He said, look, that's our only tools. That's used as much as we can. And he dedicated refining his life, refining this methodology. Uh, and maybe Christopher Alexander was also right. I think he said he, he needed something more. But I, my, my take on that, I was talking with Larry, is that he, maybe the, the technology by the, during that time, they was not able to do the programming, the computers were not able to do what Alexander was trying to do. But both are right. And so let me tell you a little bit about the structure claiming very briefly. And we go to, to other stuff. Uh, so it's a very rigorous process. It opens with, you have to write. You have, uh, it starts the project with a project definition where you, you, you state the background, the statement of the project, the goals, the resource, the schedule, the methodology, the issues that we are taking. And it's a very rigorous process, the, the sources of information, the resources that we're going to get, the calendar, who is in the team, it's a clear document for, for this. Then comes what he called the defining statements, where you also have to fill the forms in a very detailed manner, where you have to... Uh, all the teams have to understand the, who, who is the contribution, who is bringing the issue, what's the question at issue, what's the position you have, is it a constraint or something is a directive, is it an objective, uh, what alternative positions do you have. So it's like a dialogue, it's a, it's a framework to starting a very uh, interesting deep dialogue and it's very rigorous, as I said, exhaustive, it's very intense, and, uh, and also all the backgrounds and arguments position. After that, uh, when you start having a clear definition, you start in the, in the more structuring phase, where you create this top-down analysis, you break the system into parts, and which is a very logical way, where you have nouns and verbs to define each level of activity, and you try to figure out all the system, all the, all the, the big uh, challenge that you're going you're gonna to deal. So it's, it's, it's the beginning, and this helps us to understand the activities, investigate, and the activities, the activities brings the insights, insights connects to the ideas. And then all in these uh, activities, you're defining the factors that you want to deal and the solution elements that start, that we are the ideas that we start to, 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 to play. Uh, after that, you, Chuck wrote two big, uh, interesting software programs, computer programs, using Fortran. Uh, so the first one is Relaton, and it's the idea of interaction, of synergy among ideas, how one idea connects to the other one. I know I'm, I'm, I'm going too quickly here, but there is a lot of of things behind. I just want to give you an overview. And uh, you start to having people, teams, scoring ideas against each other, seeing the synergies and all this software start to relate and combining and uh, decomposing this into layers and, and groups and clustering this. Another software that he uses is, is uh, VTCOM, which is the idea of clustering 
layers of clustering. Then you have a phase of, of condensation that also runs the Viticom. And that the software gives you back a new organization, a new system. So based on your scoring in a granular level, his software were able to, was able to give another type of structure that you start to see different relations that you did expect. So starting the, 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 the principle of surprising you, it, 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 the software and the output was also coming something new to you and you start to see, wow, I, I, I never thought about this this way because you, you gave scores in a granular level and it comes there. Uh, then comes uh, another phase of synthesis where you have men's, ends, men's means ends analysis, ends means analysis, and, and you start to identify the systems element. And you, at the end, start in a, 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 a communication structure where you explain all this and the functions, and you have to reassemble the overall system and document it in a very uh, detailed structure. Um, it's generally a big, big uh, document, a big uh, output, and uh, recently very big presentations of systems and how ideas connect together. There is this book Larry showed to us, your, the books, and, and they hold the overall system here. The book is in detail. I just wanted to give you, you have uh, the, how back and forth, top, top down, bottom up, and the use of softwares to do that. Uh, how this was used? How Chuck used to do that? Uh, uh, where? Just to have you an idea, it was used and applied in, in helping the national park systems in the United States. So all the, the logic behind the national park systems was used to that. Uh, also for NASA to help design the space station, International Space Station, all the, how the astronauts would open the doors, how they would go to sleep, uh, exercise. So that was this scale, this uh, very large uh, projects, as, as Larry was saying. Also an interesting, uh, and all here, all related to product design, human factors, all knowledge, uh, being used in the, in the, into the, the structured planning combined. Also, uh, systems for corporations, that's a very famous uh, solution system for steel case called Pathways, who, 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 is, who works in the architecture, knows very well this, very systemic, uh, completely like a, a giant Lego, Lego that you combine and you create spaces in a very, very powerful, was all used in design using structured planning. Projects like uh, the House of the Future, a house that, uh, oh, and he, he was doing this way in the 80s and talking about uh, energy, uh, renewable energy, all the, how everything connects to everything, reducing waste, how the house could grow and, and reduce in size. Uh, things like tackling the, the global warming uh, issues, and he was planning uh, and designing solutions in space uh, to have f manufacturing plants in, in, in the moon to do solar panels. So he, this, this is the type of, of projects. How to evacuate a city like uh, Chicago in case of a disaster, something like this, a, a, a huge blimp that would be in space and will bring smaller cells to bring people and locate and load with people and, and put it back in, into into uh, ice space, uh, all detail the, how the engine works with the power source, everything very well detailed. So he won all this, this those prizes. So comes this this just for you to have an o overall idea. Uh, I came here in '97, and when I came here, I had to convince Chuck to work with him. He would say, no, I will not advise anyone anymore. And I thought, Chuck, I came here to study with you, not because of the ID. I knew the, the international fame, I knew the, the power. I saw him as the, the toughest guy, the most difficult scientist to work in innovation. And I want to work with him. And who I am? I, I am a Brazilian from the poorest area in Brazil, in the northeast of Brazil. But I was uh, very curious, and he saw that. 
So I was, I, I, I started university with 16 years old. I, I, with 21, I was already teaching. Uh, at the, all the students were older than me. And I was, I finished my master's degree in something very interesting called interactive evolution using genetic algorithm. And that was the computing I had at the time. I was doing genetic code for chairs, cars, having parents' cars crossing and, 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 and having child's cars and, and the users deciding they, if they like or not. And that grade was the probability of that uh, car be a father and a parent for the next generation. So using all genetic code. That was, uh, I was simulating a f uh, crime face recognition with that. And we, this is with 96. That's the top computers we had at the time. When Chuck saw that, this wow, this guy is crazy enough. I will advise you. So he said, look, you'll be the last student, but uh, let's do it. And uh, what I did was I got all the deep into the, the mat uh, of Chuck, all the structures and all the clustering methods and graphs and theories. And I crazily combined this with evolutionary computation, with genetic algorithm, uh, using cross mutation, crossover, and having a fitness function with a lot of maths and how to decide what is good, what is bad, based on people's recognition. The power of computer was still a limitation at the time. But something was, was interesting there. And, and when I finished uh, my dissertation, it was very short, less than 100 pages, which means you are really crazy because if, if if it's too big, you're okay, but <laughs> John Nash did in 28 pages his, his PhD dissertation. So that's another level. So I was trying to, to do something really short, and I, I came with 80-something, and, uh, and was really intense, really dedicated. When I finished my PhD, before the final presentation, was a group like this, I say 60 people. Chuck came to me and said, Charles, come here. Before you talk, I need to talk to you. I said, what? what? Just... He said, look, there will be about 60 people outside. You'll be talking. But I want to tell you, about three or four people, you really understand what you're talking about. But don't worry. It's, it's not your problem. It's their problem. You, you, you went uh, ahead a few years. Maybe in five years, they will, they will uh, understand what you're doing. Uh, it was not five years. It was more than that. I was in New Zealand. I was in New Zealand uh, in 2012, and I saw this presentation, and this guy talking about design thinking, the guy who really, Tim Brown, and he was talking about design thinking, and he said something here, I was, look at that. Let's see. I should. And then instead, we should be thinking. Look, one second. Should this, this way. So. Okay, sorry. So, uh, I was really, it was a great honor to be here in, 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 uh, in 2005 at the first of the Better by Design conferences. It was my first visit to New Zealand, and uh, I think like most people who come here, they fell in love with the place and fell in love with people. And, uh, it, was, it was wonderful and exciting, and it was, it was a great honor to be here actually and, 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 and talk about design thinking. And in fact, that was the period when I was sort of developing some of, some of my my thoughts about that whole topic, and uh, it sort of took root here, and, uh, and I'm excited about the way that's, uh, the way that's happened. Um, so seven, uh, seven years later, back again, and uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd come and talk to you about how I think we need to move beyond design thinking. Uh, so sorry about that. Well, he was sorry about that, but he gave uh, what his view about the future of beyond design thinking. Look, look what he said. And then instead, we should be thinking about something like this, code, in this case, genetic code. That we should be imagining the outcome of our design more like genetic code than blueprint, more like a set of instructions to let things go off into the world and, and, and behave in certain kinds of ways. It's a difficult idea, and we're not yet quite ready to actually design the genetic code itself. Not quite, but uh, he had no idea what he's talking about, but. Uh, there's something cool here that he's into something that is very powerful. And I think now we are ready. And I want to 
show you what we are doing right now with the computers, the computers today. Being generative. Generative is, design tools use a computer and algorithms to synthesize geometry, to come up with new designs all by themselves. All it needs are your goals and your constraints. I'll give you an example. In the case of this aerial drone chassis, all you would need to do is tell it something like it has four propellers, you want it to be as lightweight as possible, and you need it to be aerodynamically efficient. And then what the computer does is it explores the entire solution space, every single possibility that solves and meets your criteria, millions of them. It takes big computers to do this. But it comes back to us with designs that we, by ourselves, never could have imagined. And the computer is coming up with this stuff all by itself. No one ever drew anything, and it started completely from scratch. And by the way, it's no accident that the drone body looks just like the pelvis of a flying squirrel. It's because the algorithms are designed to work the same way that evolution does. The algorithms are the same. It's very simple. Uh, they, they start with a random population, and they, instead of searching in all solution space, it selects a random set of population and starts matching them and having cross mutation, which adds diversity, crossover, combining, and selecting what is good into a fitness function that they go to the optimum without having to search in the whole solution space. It's a very smart strategy. When I saw that, I and it was in 96, I started working in this, in design with genetic algorithms. I saw that that's, that's clearly the smartest way to search, to optimize, to do anything, to solve anything. Now the computers are coming. Uh, the last intel artificial intelligence jump we had was in multi-layer neural networks. The neural networks was almost in the 80s, were all, 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 almost forget, forgotten, and some guys insisted, insisted, and they create multi-layer, and with the power of computing, the power of data, now we have the level of in intelligence that we are managing to do, to, de to get, and all these these uh, new tools and new applications that you see. However, the real jump will come very soon, very soon. When we start having the power, and I'm not even talking about quantum computing, I'm talking about the computers we have today. When we start with the amount of data that we have, and we start combining with neural networks, combining evolutionary computation, the last book of Marvin Minsky, which was the father of neural networks, was about the motion machine. In the first chapter, he tried to have a logic, a system, a programming uh, principles to programming love. It was about love. How to make a machine to have feelings. Uh, we are very close uh, something, if this combined uh, neural networks with this emotion programming with genetic algorithm, wow, this this machine will pass through us in a speed that we never, I mean, uh, we will be behind in any sense, in any sense. In creativity, we will be able, uh, there is only one hope in my experience for, for us in this competition is uh, connecting quickly the machines with us. Let's, let's join them. Uh, that's my, my, my experience in, in this, the impact of what's coming here. And when you talk about quantum computing is even, and we, we want that. We are working hard to do that. Everywhere I see people trying to create these machines. We are systemically trying to do that. Well, I have, uh, based on this, I have also, just to show you and where I want to get with is the ma mindset, I have experience in executive, and I applied Chuck's methods, and I, a, a, a lighter version. I stopped using, because it was a rigorous process, and outside the academic environment, I couldn't afford to use it in the time I had, but I, the principles, the structure, the way to decompose systems, to see everything connected, I used to space, design spaces, product design, service design, interface, strategies, incorporations from many different projects. I cannot show you all the details. Uh, also, start designing this to design organization in systems transformation and see relationships and, or, and combining all this and still using genetic algorithm 
to, to understand people and to, because we're going to see where the complexity comes from. So to map the totality and the same, same idea that Chuck insisted during 35 years refinement, which is how can we qualify things, how do you see order, how you connect things, concepts, and see the relationships among the parts. I'm also using agent-based learning, and uh, this is an example of a simulation where each uh, circle represents people, and uh, in one scenario, this, the left one here, uh, you have uh, the individual is the green one, the, the friend is like the yellow, and the not friend is the red. So you, add, you tell every person here to, of course, simulating here is, is, is a programming, and you can do this in, with real people, uh, but you tell each one, without telling anyone in the mind, find someone which is a friend, and find someone which is a, an enemy, right? So you, how you simulate this relationship, and try to use your friend to protect from your enemy, and in the other, the other, uh, the, re the right side, it's a different approach. You say to people, look, still find two, two people, but treat them equally. Don't, f don't put yourself in a position of uh, using your friend to protect you, but treat them equally. And this is amazing, the, the combination. Uh, let me see, so, yeah. So how this, how you spend, how your individual, how an individual attitude among others changes the entropy in the system. And we can do this, I'm using agent-based modeling to, to see teams, and in that level, the, the stabilization goes very quickly. And here, so what I'm saying is, individual attitudes, behaviors, can change the overall system. Chaos theory, little things can, can have big impacts. Well, enough of this, I want to go to the mindset stuff, but today I'm, I'm working, I'm creating this company called Society of Minds, and I have cells of intelligence of crazy people like myself in mathematics, physics, evolutionary computation, comp all, the, all the computing AI stuff, and we are, we are dealing with challenges in financial markets, uh, agro-business, in the planning, the strategy for food, and also changing law in Latin America, or law, um, the, the legal procedures, uh, and how to get speed and intelligence to do that. Um, well, I don't know where, where uh, there's uh, many PhDs here. I find, I, I, I love to find talent and, and, and sharp minds and disciplined minds and scientific aspects. Uh, the mechanisms are the same of complexity, and I want to come to, a, to a, a, a conclusion here, which is there are three mechanisms of gen that generates complexity that Darwin explains in, in, 15, in 1859. Uh, mutation, and we have uh, technology which is offering new possibilities. There is mutation right there. There is combination, crossover, interconnectivities. We are physically and digitally con more connected than ever. And we have also selection, which is competition, in a global scale. So we are artificially, in our work, in our organizations, simulating three very powerful mechanisms that generate complexity. So in other words, things will be much more complicated, much more complex. There will, in any, in any context, there will be more brands, more competition, more lack of resources. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So, uh, and how we, how we approach that situation, how we handle this, how we, we influence transformation in an in a increasing complexity system. We have to, to be very smart. Um, I want to tell a story, and you might know, but there, is was, there was a city in India uh, where New Delhi, that was in the, when India was colonized by the, the British, and uh, there was an overpopulation of uh, cobra, these snakes, and uh, the officials, uh, the, the British officials, had one idea, and said, look, let's make the population 
kill the cobras. And they create the policy of, uh, so you receive money with the, with the cobras, it's a, it's a known story. Uh, when do you bring dead cobras? And after months, after three months, they saw the numbers and said, look, by the, the amount of people in New Delhi, all the snakes, all the cobras should be dead by now. And keeps coming, new cobras. So anyone could be, to, could deduct the, the population start to create in cobras, right? So they were trying the best of their intention to solve a problem and the, the explosion and uh, the population start to create in cobras like pets. And uh, when they saw that, they canceled the policy of, of in incentiving uh, co cobras. And the population, instead of killing the cobras, they, they, they let the cobras go in the forest and, 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 and the situation really worsened and was five times more cobras. This brings me a very powerful div difference in worldviews. And I want to talk about you, which is the core of how I see this mindset thing. And these two worldviews are very extreme. And I want to talk about this. First one, and maybe these officials were using, states like this. There is one reality. This reality is homogeneous, is objective, and it's stable, right? And the key questions in this worldview is, is true or false, is right or wrong? Aristotle, which I spoke in the beginning, was kind of the father of this, and he said, there is this or not this. That was one principle of the law of the thinking. But the questions were true or false, right or wrong. And if it's false and if it's wrong, there is a problem. We have a problem. And if we have a problem, the solution is avoid it, fix it, correct, educate, punish. That's the solutions we come from. In this view, crisis is destructive, right? We don't want, we don't want to have crisis. It's not good, it's, it's destructive. I call this view classic. It's re reductionist, it's oriented to the parts, it's linear, it's, it's intent to control the system, it loves defin defining, defin defining and, and, and define things and, and put t labels, it loves measure and loves quantification. We love quantify. We love the, the, the numbers, the statistics. That's a very powerful word view. But there is another one which I want to con contrast with this one. That there is not one reality, but multiple realities. It's never homogeneous, it's always singular. It's never objective, it's intersubjective. The notion of reality is created among us. Even the, no the concept of self is built in the interaction among us. It's never stable, it's always dynamic and adaptive. And the key questions are not true or false, but works or doesn't work, makes sense or doesn't make sense. And in this view, Aristotle was a fool because this or not this is not enough. Could be this and not this, this and that, neither this, neither that, a bit of this, a bit of that, sometimes this, sometimes that. And the most critical thing here, the difference here is, in this view, there are no problems, only patterns. There is no problem. So there is no problem, there is no solution. There is only a way. And the way is learn, evolve, grow, self-organize, and adapt. It's the way that nature uses. Crisis here is never destructive. It's crisis is opportunity. It's an opportunity, it's, it's the systems telling that there is a better solution. And I call this view quantum. It's a holistic, it's participatory, it's nonlinear, it's based on relationship, it's the knowledge that all is flux, and what I want is qualify. Qualify, see the relations among things. Of course, when I'm flying, when I came here flying, I want that the, the guy who designed my plane use this side of the view, right? That's what we want. Uh, however, I cannot apply this view here to my marriage, for example, or to the education of my son, because it's completely different. Where I'm getting here is that we get in trouble when we, we mix when to use one view or another view. 
And I want to, 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 to make a cut here, which is, I say in the very being, uh, very dry, let's say, or scientific dry, but I would say this side works very well for complicated things. Cars have problems, watches have problems, airplanes have problems, but marriage don't have problems. They have patterns. Child education is not a problem. It's a pattern. There is a pattern here. And I want to talk more about pattern. Uh, and we were very much educated, brainwashed about with this side here. What we received in our education was really all this view from the left. We haven't much experience. We don't even have repertoire about the other side. Right? We we say things like the pillars of my company, right? Pillars? If all is flux, how can you say pillar? pillars? Buildings have pillars, not companies, not organization of people. So we are very far away of, of understanding what's going on. Another thing, what define complicated? What's the cut of complicated and complex? One key element is that three mechanism that I said. Mutation, crossover, is life. It's, the, it's this dynamic process. Also, because this dynamic process allows order and disorder coexist. Uh, in complicated things, order and disorder doesn't coexist. In complex things, they do. You can love me and you can hate me. You can, you can right? You can uh, be in engaged in the company or, or at the same time be disengaged about another thing you can be so and I'd say women uh, are very in, in, in advance here because I think they operate much more on the complex side on the quantum I think they use quantum logic and we have to catch up here as well uh, order and disorder the coexistence we don't have repertoire for the complex we have only rep repertoire for the complicated things. We are trying to use complicated methods and solutions and tools for complex things. It's not going to work. What we need? Uh, first, we need to understand and to come with another language to understand complex systems. We need to understand that there is only one design of the system, one geometry, one topology, which is a network. It's never a matrix. It's never a chart, organizational chart, because a system has agents, these agents have purpose, and they have interconnection, interconnected. It's so complex, the combinatorial explosion here is huge. You know all the, the Chinese farmer tale, right? You know, the, the, you know uh, there was this Chinese farmer, and uh, he had one horse, and the horse ran away, and then the neighbors come at night and say, look, how sad. Your horse, your only horse, run away. And he said, maybe. I mean, so sad, terrible. And he said, maybe. Next day, the horse comes back and brings six horses, new horses, wild horses to his farm. And the friends know that, saw that. At night, they go in his house and say, look, how fantastic, awesome. You had one horse, now you have seven horses. That's amazing. And the Chinese farmer said, maybe. Next day, his son is going to try to hide a horse, a wild horse, and falls from the horse and breaks his leg. The, 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 the friends saw that at night in his house, always at night in his house, and then they said, terrible thing. Your only son broke his leg. It's terrible. You were devastated. And said, maybe. The next day, the, it's always in the morning, uh, the, the Chinese uh, army comes to find young people to go to the war. And when saw in his house, he's with a broken leg, and and doesn't. And the the, the friends comes and say, "Look, it's uh, it's fantastic." And he said, "Maybe." We never know, even if the good that happens with us in the system is really good or is bad. We don't know the consequences. It's so unpredictable. But we know that the system has a field, and in physics, field means a zone of influence. It's a field. It's an invisible zone of influence. And, it, 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 and I think the, the field 
influence that has so much power. Sometimes we think we are influencing the field, but the field is influencing us. The field decides who is going to win the election. The field is very powerful, and we are not able to, to understand the field. The field has regularities. These regularities have patterns. These patterns can be coherent or incoherent with the, with the pur purpose of the agents. And it's everything depends on everything. Sometimes we say we commemorate the Independence Day, right? But uh, we should be celebrating the Dependence Day because we, we depend on everybody and everybody depends on everybody. So it's all about the pattern of interactions um, of this. And there are many dynamics here. There are, there are positive feedbacks. There are negative feedbacks that keeps the systems stable. Of course, you know all about this. But one point I want to make is Socrates said the source of all evil is ignorance and the source of all good is knowledge. I would say for systems, the source of all good for systems is coherence. The source of all complex, uh, bad things in complex systems is incoherence. You want to, to improve, evolve your systems in, in, in organizations or even at home, start by taking the incoherence. Because if you say something and you're doing something and you're acting, if the agents are acting incoherent with the declared purpose, they will never go far. Agents are very smart. They create snakes. They create cobras. No one is silly. Socrates used to say that uh, there is a sun in everybody, and I think there is intelligence. We, we don't lack power. We don't lack creativity. That's, that's the wrong uh, side, the, the, the classic side saying that we are not enough, we're not creative. We just want peace in, in this engine. And uh, the quantum side said, no, 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 you, you are very important. How to influence the system? That's what's the big question. How can we influence? We can never control. We know that we can control the system. And I want to bring a lesson from the bacteria. Uh, scientists, they put this table, and they create some holes in the table. I don't know if you saw this. And they, they said this. They put zero antibiotics here in the corner, in the uh, extremis, and one times antibiotics, 10 times, 100 times, and a thousand times. And they put some bacteria here. And suddenly the bacteria spread out in minutes in this area. But then something happened. The first mutants, look at the word, mutants, entered the news. They were, they were individuals in the former population that was able to handle the challenge of one time antibiotics. And the same, they multiply and they do that. And the same thing happens for 10 times, the mutants enter the they holes and, and, and multiply. In 11 days, they manage to handle a thousand times more. Not everybody that was in the initial con uh, situation, the population is, is there. But the mutants are the key. There is only one way to influence a system, is by virus, is by contagious by connecting with someone that thinks like you and, and, and stop in, in, in connection and exploring, connecting and opening the connection and talking the same language. Uh, I want to talk about a very important principle that I discovered in quantum physics, which is the holographic principle. You might, you might know. The guy who created the hologram was called Denis Gabo, and he was a mat Hungarian mathematician, and he created this in the 70s, the mathematics of the hologram. And which basically is, uh, when, and they had to wait until the 60s when the laser was invented. But the hologram, which you know there in the Leia, Princess Leia, is uh, a laser beam divided by mirrors. And one of the side of the laser beams pass through an object, in this case here in the bottom, an apple. And they, the two beams meet each other uh, again in the surface this in the plate, in the holographic plate. And what register in this plate is not the shape of the apple, like the negative shape, like a regular photography. But what register is the pattern of interference, interference pattern. In physics, interference pattern is when waves meet, when waves bunch each other. And it's like 
a swimming pool. You can throw a rock in a pool and create this pattern. And this pattern is very powerful. But that's when you hit the laser here, the apple shows up. When you release the light, the apple becomes. But what the, the scientists discover is that if we break and if we have cuts in this holographic uh, surface plate that has uh, some register of the pattern, and we hit the laser there, it's not the whole uh, a part of the apple that shows up. It's everything. It's the apple. So the, the part has the whole, and the whole has a part. It's all non-local, non-local interaction. And that's very powerful. And when the Carl Pilgrim, uh, a neuroscientist in the 60s, saw that from David Bohm, the theoretical quantum physics physicist, he saw that and said, wow, that's something there. Because he was show, uh, understanding the, the mind and saw the connections between the synapses, and he discovered that the same mathematics, the same Fourier transformation that becomes every, transforms everything in waves, was used by our minds. In other words, our mind is a holographic antenna. It, it, it has everything. Emotion, it's all there. You have the plasticity. You can, they did experience in rats and, and animals. They took part and they, suddenly they remember the, the maze. So it's, it's a beautiful uh, principle. And maybe our minds are really an antenna to some more powerful uh, dimension. But let me bring to the real, you theoret, uh, abstracting too much. Let's bring to a real example what I'm talking about. First is this. Look, I don't know if you have seen this picture. These are two uh, crossroads, and uh, one side, the light is on, and the power, the sign, how to say, sign light, sign post? Uh, traffic lights. The traffic lights it, are working well, and this side, was a power outage and, and it's chaos. No one is in charge. No one was trained that. Look what happened. Look what happened. Oops. The other side we know. We are used to that, right? Free negotiation. Well, there will be a traffic traffic now. Chara. So what I'm saying is uh, we are not in the traffic. We are the traffic, right? So it's the same holo holographic principle. There is no locality in complex systems. We are never an observer. We are always a participant. And uh, it's hard to understand that because the classic view tells you, no, no, you are observing, there is the system and yourself, and you are out of the system. And quantum physics show that's not the case. One video. I developed a way of looking at this. David really Bond. Intricate order that's based really on the quantum field. And the way it works is to consider that there's a wave. You may think of this wave coming from outside the whole universe, which uh, converges to a point and then diverges again. Now it, it links everything. It means that everything is internally related to everything. Now, uh, one of the uh, images I gave of a, of a piece of paper. When you unfold it, you find a pattern. Now, I'm proposing that the basic law of quantum mechanics can be understood in that way. We can think of it something unfolding into a way and then it really folds into something even like a particle. So the each particle will then unfold all the other particles. In principle, every particle will fold. It will matter, of course, which view we hold. If we hold a, if we have a view of wholeness, this will enable us to work differently from when we have a view which is broken up. Now, the mechanistic view tends to be to 
is to support this fragmentation. And as we know that our whole life is now fragmented, and we can see it into nations struggling with each other, into all sorts of professional groups and competitions. Uh, regarding each, an inside each person, there are many fragments different objectives and different purposes fighting each other. Now, uh, if we take the view of mechanism, we may regard all these fragments as essentially real and independent, and then we can see it. Now, what we have to see is that these fragments are actually the result of our strong way of looking at the whole. That, uh, we are looking at the whole as a physical way of fragments, and our very action and response to this helps to break things up some more. <laughs> For example, if we say the world is broken up into nations, we see each nation is independent. That's going on now. But we would rather see that they're actually independent in the world of the world. Let me, uh, the audio is not that loud. Let me try to explain what he, he called holo movement. And I think that's the key, uh, the best theory that explains everything in quantum physics is, is his theory. He said, uh, it's called the, the implicate order. He, he said that reality, it's like a, a wall and we have access to this dimension. In this case, two dimensions. And what we think is like in, in, in physics was the particles, the entanglement between atoms, and they were having spooky actions at distance. When something happened to this, something happened to the other one, we could not calculate the momentum and the velocity. And what Bohm said, look, we have access to this side of the wall, but in reality, it's, it's an illusion of separation. In reality, in a in another dimension, in a higher dimension, behind the wall, it's a, in a three dimension in this case, what, thinks, what we think is separate is the same thing. We, connect, we are connected to everything. The, any separation is an artificial division and uh, fundamentally we are connected. And we can go and go on the theory. To finish, two slides. One is, I think there is a way and I'm experiencing doing this, that I discovered that's very powerful. I am a practitioner of Aikido, and uh, I think there is a gentle way to do that. And they, where Hei Woshiba, when he was creating the Aikido, he was creating something to avoid conflict, to use the effort to stop the conflict, like a dance. And I, I, I found a very nice description of the, lay, the law of the reverse effort. Let me see if I can read for you guys. The law of reverse effort. The harder we try with the conscious will to do something, the less we shall succeed. Proficiency and the results of proficiency come only to those who have learned the paradoxical art of doing and not doing, or combining relaxation with activity, of let go, letting go as a person in order that the imminent and transcendent unknown may take hold. We cannot make ourselves understand. The most we can do is to foster a state of mind in which understanding may come to us. We, sometimes we are working too hard trying to control the systems and spending a lot of power and energy and there is a gentle way. There is a gentle, uh, curious, uh, evolutionary way to infect people and, and, and combine this. But all this final means to systems and design, I, I just wrote a few things here and I want to share to you as a provocation. First, problem solving is a limited description, very limited. It works for the complicated but not for the complex. It's how we can influence, it, influence the evolution of interference patterns. We can, have to improve the interference patterns between the agents and in a coherently way taking the incoherency away. Another point I would like to make is scientific philosophical deepness bring relevance and protagonism to any discipline, to design as well. I think we as discipline as design we went very nice, I appreciate, we went close to the anthropology, the humans, human science, but uh, we could, we could have done that without forgetting the scientists, the deductive reasoning. 
which I think it, it's, it's make us strong in effort, uh, as more, more strong. So deduction is a very sophisticated logic where the Greeks have created, and we are using a very low level. We are, we are in the organizations, we are using only one, which is analogy. We are thinking in cases. We need the templates, we need the cases, we need the methods that others use. So it's a, the human mind has much more power to, to be used, as the Greek said. Another thing, uh, careful not to be seen or used just as a tool. We have a way of thinking, and uh, this thinking, it's not only design, it's, it's, it's available any disciplines to, to us, and there are many other disciplines and systems that we can learn and we can combine if we want. Uh, two more provocations. Lead the design of new interference patterns for adapting to environmental change. We have to do this everywhere, every day, and we have to use our influence to, to, to influence uh, organizations to do that. It's not, it's the time is, is very, we have to learn to adapt to these environmental changes that are coming. And I would say work hard on the design of our integration with machines as soon as possible. Uh, if we don't integrate with machines quick enough, we, I don't know what's going to happen. I'm very afraid. And I work with this stuff. I know the power of evolutionary computation. I know the computers that are coming, the, the uh, quantum computing power that we'll be able to do if we program emotion using genetic algorithm, using evolutionary computation with a, with a, a, a pepper of emotion in this, in this cooking, uh, it will be very powerful. We need to, to work as designers. We need to, to find a way to to reduce this gap. And uh, as Chuck always said, let's keep the view of wholeness. And I think where I am today, where I'm thinking these theories, all come from the same spirit, the same behavior, the same interest, the same curiosity, optimism of thinking the whole and trying to picture, to map relationships that uh, way back the Greeks started. So that's the tradition I, I, I'm trying to keep. And I received this gift from my mentor. And uh, yeah, I have put this all in a, in a book, if you like this type of conversation. It's called The Holographic Innovation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. Sure. So I'm asking uh, Dr. Bezerra to pull up a function structure from his slide so I can tell you a real-world story of how uh, Chuck Owen saved my ass one day, okay? So um, uh, function structures are one of the stages that Charles taught us about how you use structured planning in order to solve something complicated. And 21 years ago or thereabouts, we were trying to create a new system for Steelcase that you mentioned, the pathway system. Yep. And this was to reinvent the world's most successful cubicle system, Dilbert World, called Series 9000. At Steelcase at that time, they would spend on average about two years designing a new system. And they were asking Doblin, using the methods from this school to try to show them if there might be a better way. They were deeply skeptical. They were, after all, the world's largest office furniture company, and we were a firm of 28 or so guys. And, um, and, and so we were working up to what we called the gong show, a time when we would show them about 30 or 40 different advances for their business, one of which was a new replacement for the biggest office furniture system in the world. This was so important to them that their COO, an absolutely lovely man named Frank Merlotti, had taken to flying to Chicago every week to see if we were making enough progress. And we were two weeks away, Charles, from the climactic gong show where we were supposed to work uh, out 30 different major advances. And on the day that he was coming, two weeks ahead of the of the deadline, it was a magic day for us, because after weeks and weeks of brutal work, we had our function structure for the first time, okay? And so this was kind of the form it was in. All function structures look fundamentally the same. 
and I'm showing the CEO of Steelcase a diagram like this. And, he, and he's looking at his calendar and saying, you guys are going to have a new system in two weeks. And he said, and this is where you are? And he was a very gracious man. So what he said to me is, well, you know, there's 30 things that you're working on. What if we were to just take this one off the agenda? You know, because I just, I really, I really want you guys to come out well. And, and I understood what he was saying. He was politely saying, there's no way to have a final systemic capability two weeks from now if this is all you got. Now to explain it in plain American that dogs and cats can read, when you've got a really complicated system, what a function structure does for you is it breaks the whole system into bits and pieces, bite-sized nuggets that you can solve. And it's specifically telling you that the bite-sized nugget over here is not related at all to the bite-sized nugget over there. So you can put teams in connection to the actual problems you're trying to solve without losing any confidence that as you solve those individual problems, the entire big system of requirements will be delivered. That's what a function structure does for you. So here's what I said to Frank Merlotti. I said, Frank, look, we, we could screw this up from where we are. You're right. We really could. But I just want you to try to sort of live in the question a little longer. Because, you know, honestly, even though you think it's impossible from where we are, according to our schedule, we are actually two days ahead of where we needed to be at this moment. And he said, okay. He says, I said, Frank, I promise I'll pull it off the agenda even at the last minute if we, if we screw it up. He said, okay. And he was feeling a little better at least about that promise, right? Two weeks later, we showed a system that had about 50 or 60 advances over their then state-of-the-art system. And it was prototyped, and it was, you know, paper prototypes and cardboard, but it was physical, and it was real, and we had solved some of the toughest problems in the Steelcase organization. And to sort of tell you where that went, for the last 20 years, the single biggest sponsor of everything in the history of the Institute of Design has been Steelcase not just because of the Pathways Project, but because they saw how a bunch of people just using systems thinking and good methods managed to create a system significantly better than anything that they had in their developmental horizon in about three months total time versus their normal development cycle of two years of total time. So ladies and gentlemen, the world that we've all benefited from, the world that Charles L. Owen built for us, and the way in which we all learn to try to break down hard, gnarly things into bite-sized nuggets, has, um, has been, I think for me, Charles, and I think probably for you too, a life gift. So, um, so that is what we're trying to acknowledge today and to honor and to celebrate and to pass on so that maybe the the progress and the wisdom that Chuck Owen has taught us will uh, be like the ripples in the pond that uh, have positive interference and amplification, Charles. I know you must have some questions for Charles. We're going to do it for a few minutes, and then we're going to have a, a, a special toast to uh, Chuck Owen from the poor son of a bitch that had to teach his class after he stopped teaching it. <clears throat> and, um, uh, but are there any questions that somebody wants to ask Dr. Bezerra? Zone of influence versus the holographic effect. Yes. Yeah, I think it's just a, a level of description, but uh, the zone of influence is the field. For example, in a house, there, there are houses that, let's say a music, there are houses, the interaction pattern between the people in the house, let's say play uh, rock. Is, is, is the, the, the output, the result is of the music is rock. In other houses are jazz. It's a, it's a, the dynamic is more slow, the interactions, like the, 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 the animals in the desert, in the, in the desert, is, is like jazz. So there are, so this is the, that's the music that the field plays. The, the holographic principle is more on the non-locality. Everything is distributed. So it's, it's, it's also a principle that 
is in the field, uh, but it's, it's a more focusing on the non-locality aspects, where right? everything is part of everything is there. But the field, when I mean the, the field, is the field of influence is that comes up with the, the result of interaction, is the pattern of the, of the field. So I don't know if I'm I able to explain this. We can, we can talk more with examples. Hi, Hans. OK. Hi. Um, this looks like a very amazing process to deal with a lot of very, very complex, big, big challenges. Yes. And I guess my question comes from, because our world is becoming increasingly more networked and it's becoming faster, technology is improving faster, uh, innovation is moving faster, how does such a rigorous process like this, which seems to take quite a long time, um, once it creates this output, which is proposing a new system or a new way of dealing with the uh, intervention, uh, how, does, how do you then iterate on that without going through this rigorous process again, sure. uh, which takes a long time, and by that point you might be back behind the eight ball? Sure, I think it's still very powerful, and uh, it's based on the technology that they have, uh, Chuck had in the, in the time. I think the challenge today and the new tools that we have, we can do much more uh, powerful things systemically. We need to create a new tool, new tool set, new methodologies in terms of, uh, it's, it's almost like from structured planning, how can we do un unstructured influences? You see, I'm, I'm playing with the name of the methodology, but we need, uh, we need the interest. We need uh, more people researching this and exploring these new tools, these evolutionary tools. We have a big limitation in our thinking because I told you the mind is holographic, but this screen is, is, is arresting us. The limitation of the screen, the limitation of linear slides where we put the information is just hell. I mean, I hate this. This is, this is much worse. Our minds are able of much more. So I would say we need more stories, more ways of communicating, creating a new language, new tools. And there are plenty of, of insights and new stuff, the swarmy behavior, uh, the tools that simulate, the simulation tools, the computing that we have today. The, the, the issue is that some people are thinking this is too complicated, uh, they are afraid of the challenge, they want the easy, easy path. And I think the easy path at the end of the day doesn't pay off. I, I like the difficult one, the hard one, the, and I think this is a very powerful. And uh, just, just that, be humble and uh, dive on something that you don't know, but uh, I see very exciting possibilities with the, the new tools that we have. But understanding Chuck and participating in that, that was the context of the time, the rigors, even himself as a, a, a guy who had spent some time in the military, so very disciplined, very rigid, very structured. I think today, uh, structured planning would be evolving and, and I, I think that's a great challenge to do and uh, I would love that more people would be interested on, on doing that. Thank you. I, I, sure. I think it was, uh, I wanted to ask a similar question. Um, the question would be, how do you see this standalone um, software, structure planning, uh, how the idea of it might evolve into the space that you described of human beings working together with machines? Uh, I wonder if you can be a little bit more specific as you were just answering uh, the question of the other uh, person here. Yeah, I think uh, the disintegration, it's the integration power uh, of combining our minds. Uh, we have, for example, the interface problem. That's a big problem we have. Reading is slow, man. I mean, our teenagers today don't, don't read, of course, but they're able to see videos, and when the video is boring, they speed up things. I see my son doing that. Because we have an inter interface problem. We need to, to be able to speed up, uh, because our minds can do much more. What's holding us back? is the technology, the, the, the way we use it, this interface problem. We are stuck in slides and, and without seeing the big picture, the models, the overall thing. And I think uh, the, the non-locality, the holographic principles could help us. The evolutionary uh, computation uh, 
also can help us a lot in, in, in dealing with this complex in a much more sophisticated way. If I say, you, I loved your uh, metaphor of the acupuncturist, acupun how do you say? Acupuncture. Uh, the difference of a, a bad one uh, uh, with a good one is the, um, the, the numbers of needles, right? Because the, 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 the good guy just need one or two but the, the, the not expert will, will put needles everywhere. So that's, uh, I think there are, there are plenty of opportunities to be very precise and with the new tools that we have. I'm very excited this, but we have many big challenges to, to deal. Sorry. Okay, the, uh, the practices of design have been moving to the culture of co-creation in the last 10 years, both with the dem democratization of design thinking yeah. and with the new landscape of design moving from participatory to co-creation. So the role of the stakeholder, and you know, we do so many more informal methods yes. to democratize and in a way kind of destructure what you, uh, prob uh, uh, so working in more creative ways, but sometimes take longer, the decisions are fuzzier. It's very difficult to move stakeholders into this type of um, structured or precise space, and I know this takes different iterations. But how do you how do you recommend working with uh, working with stakeholders and co-creation with more uh, you know with more uh, rigorous yeah. or transformative yeah. processes? Yeah, like I would that? say uh, even this process, structured planning, that shot to refine everything was based on teams and iteration and collaborative. Uh, like we have today, the culture, they all, everybody has a voice and the way interact together. So. I, I think that's just, uh, uh, there was an improvement. We are more popular now in terms of uh, design thinking and disciplines and this type of collaboration. But uh, that's form. I'm, I'm talking about what logic you're using to achieve the results, what type of, uh, and we are using limited logics. We are stuck with analogy. We are in love with the case systems, the, all the business education is based in cases uh, which it uses a very limited analogy which is lo the logic is analogy but we have induction we can use ab abduction that the logic that the doctors use but the most powerful one we know it's deduction and uh, I have seen very few people understanding that when you f first get the universal principles the fundamental the first principles from that you can guarantee your inf 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 uh, conclusion based on the premises. So logically, it's the most advanced, powerful, and the, Greek know, the Greeks uh, knew that 2,500 years ago. So I think we have in our hands if we want. So I'm talking about how to hack the system, how to really discover the new stuff. And of course, in the form, and I think st even structured planning, Chuck was always, I think we are using the methods very collaboratively. I'm, what I'm talking about, what logic, what scientific principle are you using? And I think we are, we as a discipline, I saw a move uh, away from the hard uh, logical, the, the, the sophisticated logic. That's my criticism. I, I, I don't know if many people agree, but that's my criticism. Thank you. Yes, let's, not, let's acknowledge Charles. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Professor. Thank you no, you're good. Thank you. I am not going to do uh, Dr. Bazzara the uh, strange disservice of giving him a book. He already has one signed by the professor himself. Uh, I will tell you that any time I had a chance to spend an evening with Chuck Owen, it was always a delight. I remember one time we were having oysters, and Chuck, you know, on the side, had actually worked with the U.S. Department of Fisheries and created the naming system for all the fish in the sea. That was kind of cool. But one of the things that he was also an expert in was oyster beds. So when we were ordering oysters, he would say, oh yes, well this oyster bed, because of the shape of the oyster bed and the way the uh, salt water rushes over it, will have an extra briny texture. And he would, ex I mean, the, the man knew his stuff, okay? And it was like shocking to be in the presence of that much expertise. One of the guys that I think truly appreciates both the systemic nature of his mind, its subtleties, its themes and variations, is my good friend and great colleague, John Pippino, we all call him Pip, 
and maybe you could give us a little toast before the drinking to our great friend, Charles L. Owen. Sir. Thanks, buddy. Hi, everybody. Uh, my full name is John Pippino. Everybody calls me Pip. Um, a question for you all. How many of you have a mentor? Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, more than one is uh, bonus points. Please, when you're done with the conference this weekend, call your mentor. Email her. Give him a shout. Let him know, let her know how important they are to you. My mentor is Chuck Owen. It's not easy to speak in the past tense yet. I've only had about half a day to get used to it. Uh, when I first worked with Chuck, and I had the chance to work with him professionally, to co-teach his class with him, to teach his class in his absence, and then to inherit his class. Extraordinary honor. Uh, and when I was first working with Chuck and learning about systems thinking, I thought after a month or so, I, I was really beginning to understand it. And I said, so let me get this straight. Let me try this out with you. When, so, when a systems thinker walks into the room and hits the light switch, uh, it closes a normally open circuit and sends carefully uh, moderated electrons through a framework of wires. And those electrons have come from other switches where they've been stepped down and transformed. And, and those electrons came from a generation facility. And that generation facility is almost always burning some type of fossil fuel, which depended on species no longer with us perishing long ago and being compressed into something that we could consume. And Chuck listened patiently and said, well, yes, but try not to forget that people just want the light to go on. <laughs> and so in that spirit, <laughs> that sometimes we can make things complicated and sometimes we, in doing so, we forget how simple they really are. Let's take a quick fly through before cocktail time of Chuck's life. How did we get from a structure like this to a day like this when Chuck delivered his archival presentation, a tradition of IIT and one where he shared many of the projects and methods that Charles has introduced to you. How did all this get there? Well, it would be patently unfair if I didn't candidly tell you that none of it would have happened, none of it probably would have happened, if not for his wife, Mary. Mary Wren Owen and Chuck have been married 51 years, and marriage itself is a pretty extraordinary systems problem. 51 years suggest that they have pretty extraordinary system solutions. Chuck was very candid about Mary's role in his life and his work. Uh, she was the one who got his programs to run for the first time. And he was very honest when he suggested that one of the brightest things an aspiring design methodologist can do is marry a really good computer programmer. So everything for Chuck revolved around pride of place. He was enormously proud of the place where he grew up. This was not his house, but it was right around the corner from where his mother taught school uh, in a town near Chicago called Skokie. And this is our friend Chuck in his youthful days when he decided to set out to start his secondary and advanced education. And so he came here to Crown Hall to pursue a degree at the Institute of Design. And he discovered to his dismay, he was a gigantic jazz fan, and he discovered to his dismay
that Crown Hall, which is right here, had been built on top of a legendary jazz hall called Mecca Flats. And Mecca Flats is right out there too today. So Chuck, things didn't work out for him the first time at IIT. He went instead to Purdue, studied chemistry in this building, and when he left Purdue, he became a naval officer, rising to the position of chief engineer of the USS Mansfield. Trying to figure out what a chief engineer does is a pretty extraordinary task for people not close to these kinds of activities. For me, it was pretty easy. My niece is an officer in the Navy. I texted her and said, hey, what does a chief engineer do? And she said, well, a chief engineer is the third person in charge of any vessel at sea. They have the responsibility for everyone, the safety of everyone on board. But mainly, they know exactly why every rivet and pump is on that vessel, where it is, what it does, and what the consequences are if it fails. So despite all of these activities in Chuck's life, his general sense was that he still had a great deal of ground to cover. And he thought to himself over and over again, still, my education is not complete. And he came back and joined this legendary photograph that also includes our old friend Jay Doblin. This is the faculty of the Institute of Design in 1966 on these stairs at that hall. And in those days, Chuck, with Mary's help, got the code to work for structured planning. And he spent several decades sharing it with students and asking himself, asking them to ask themselves again and again. What's the problem? What is the problem? What is it that you're really trying to solve? And it seems so straightforward, so simple. And while he was helping us, students, faculty, friends, colleagues, understand that, he was visible to the world in a number of other ways in publications, as a consultant. And throughout all of his career, he stares at us enigmatically, like the Sphinx, like Mona Lisa, a smile that's slightly pleased and perhaps a little bit puzzled. He never forgot that life was supposed to be fun. He was an expert bartender with a passion for martinis. Late in life, he developed a bit of a tremor. Sometimes it would make students apprehensive. He would always reassure them, the tremor goes away after two martinis. Also part of his life, as Larry mentioned, the extraordinary beauty of shells. Every single shell doesn't need to be beautiful. It needs to be functional. Why is it beautiful too? These are the kinds of questions that Chuck always encouraged us to ask. As he got ready for retirement, he began to assemble his notes, some of them from the design process laboratory that Charles mentioned. And he published in an incredible flurry of articles about topics that are today in play at this conference. All kinds of problems that we think we've solved, we find a new approach to them, turns out they are vexing us still. And for the record, Chuck codified his life's work in slices like this. So what do I take away from it? In short, 
It's all about people. It's all about us. It's all about you. We need to focus on people, but don't forget the context that we all work in, that we all live in. When we have ideas, try to say them visually. But my goodness, please become a good writer. Chuck could not stand a misplaced comma. The greatest gift that Chuck gave me was optimism, to be an optimist. But it's okay to take it with a, spe a teaspoon of skepticism. They go pretty well together. And don't be afraid of complicated, gigantic problems. But do ask yourself again and again, what is the problem? So my promise to my friend, Chuck Owen, is a commitment here in public to never consider my education to be complete in honor of the things that I learned from him over the years. And I will say, tonight, when I drink water, I will remember who dug the well. Cocktail time. So you all know, again, I mentioned this at the outset, uh, Mary has been watching us all on a live feed. So let us all send a little, I have a picture here. A picture of Mary on the live feed. Let us all just send a round of applause to Mary, tell her we're thinking of her, and say thanks. At the outset of our day, ladies and gentlemen, I reminded you that the world we live in is surrounded by complicated problems. They seem to be getting worse, not easier. The only way they'll give up their secrets is if we can learn to take them seriously, to tackle them with courage and confidence and endless curiosity. It's been a delight to be in a room with this many people committed to having that kind of impact on the world. And I, um, I couldn't imagine a better way to celebrate than to do so by acknowledging a man who set many of us on that path four decades ago, long before most of us thought it was a reasonable or, or possible thing to try to achieve. So um, there's Mary. Uh, sitting with Mary today is the actual dean of the Institute of Design. Um, and I don't want to make any of this any sadder or more maudlin than we've already made it, but I do want to say it really is a giant pleasure to be among people that understand that the world needs design at a level that's deeper, more systemic, more comprehensive, more urgent than ever before. Um, let's begin tonight by having a nice set of drinks upstairs. Um, Carlos will give us some logistics in a moment. Um, but please, ladies and gentlemen, recognize that we all share the challenge of getting a better future to show up somewhat ahead of its regularly scheduled arrival. That's, that's our challenge, that's our joy, and that's our work. So thank you very much for staying in this conversation all day long. I, um, I could not... Uh, um, stand here without telling two stories that I think is just fascinating from my personal experience. I just want to share that. And part of sharing that is because I think it's what Pip said. Um, congratulate your mentor. Call him. And for all of us that are in the position of mentorship, um, think about the impact that you can have on people. 
So for me, those are the big lessons that I had. And um, so when I joined the Institute of Design, and um, one of the uh, amazing experience was uh, Charles was here, and we have a group of PhD students. By the way, Chuck, uh, we never mentioned this here, but uh, Chuck is the one that planned and started the PhD program here at ID. The first PhD program in the United States was all envisioned by uh, Chuck, okay? So 30 years ago, he started, and Charles was the first one to graduate from the PhD program here. Not the first one to enter, but the first one to graduate. Um, and Chuck envisioned this entire program of the PhD. And I, um, I always remember that uh, when we had to uh, present papers for conference, and we had to do an internal review of that paper here. So the internal review was nothing more than um, sitting down with uh, Chuck, uh, John Haskett, Sharon Poggenpo, Patrick Whitney, and, um, and many that will be invited into that. And you will be bombarded by all angles and everything else. And after that, we always um, had that joke. It's like, why do I need to go to the conference after that review? So it for us was like, I don't need anything more than just kind of that kind of interaction. So that's one of the things that uh, stay in my memories forever because of the luxury of having this group of people in an intimate room, um, having that kind of discussion through um, from six to 10 o'clock at night uh, was just like unbelievable. And a second one was on a more personal note. It was, we were in the um, La Salle building um, in the second floor, and the PhD students together with the faculty, the fact that they have their office, and we were all in the middle, um, so they look more like guardians for us. Um, and um, I remember those, um, so one of the, the key things is that I learned how to survive the winter in Chicago because of Chuck. I came from Rio, so the coldest day in the year is 15 degrees Celsius, 60 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, that's the day that everybody put a jacket, and, um, and many times, and most of the time, people don't go out. Uh, that was my, my winter, and coming to Chicago, straight from Chicago. Um, and the winter, uh, I remember those days that Chuck will come into that space in the second floor, and then um, in the coldest days of Chicago, and he will take off his jacket after his long walk, and he will say, the winter is great. And I look at him and say, like, how can you say something like that? Because he said, it makes me feel alive. So he always liked to walk in the coldest day just to be able to feel alive. And after that, I started to take long walks in Chicago um, because of him and learning how to uh, survive uh, the winter in Chicago. So um, those are just uh, my personal notes. Um, just before we go for the, for the break now and for the celebration cocktail, I just, um, many of you have been asking about the book. Um, we, um, you, we, we only found four books uh, after moving from La Salle and um, to other uh, building and then coming here. Uh, we moved a lot of the archives and we didn't have the opportunity to, uh, and um, just before now, when we we're going to uh, give some kind of gift to the, to the uh, speakers, um, we had that idea, it's like, I remember those books, so let's try to find them. So Madeline uh, went through the archives and could find four books by coincidence or for, the, for the four speakers. So we don't have those books, but I want to point you uh, to go to the website because you have a lot of material that you can find there. So if you go to um, our community, and you go to faculty, and you go down, you're gonna find um, Charles Owen here. And if you click on Charles Owen, you're gonna have his bio, and here you can have all his articles. He was a prolific writer, and he wrote extremely well, okay? So, interesting to think about that he was writing design thinking I wonder how many of you have ever thought that design thinking came from a lot of his thinking. And you can find 
all that and you can find projects okay future of living systems and uh, project phoenix solar power satellite and you can this is a classic one from chuck owen so go to the website you can find a lot of this material there's articles that in pdf that you can download and the book is just like a major compilation of structural planning but um, as people are saying before he um, uh, after retiring he just organized systematically as he's always have done in his life all the work that he has done and put that uh, together uh, for all of us so you can look at the website and I um, today is a sad day but he as everybody said here he was someone that was very optimistic about everything and he was a curious person always looking for the future so I have to um, think that um, his death today is part of his plan of saying okay here's a moment guys look for the future so I'm gonna take that and celebrate his uh, life um, moving forward and I think it's our torch to take that forward so thank you for all of you to be part of this today of this tribute I've been a full year trying to plan that and I, every single day we have not sure if we couldn't make it and as I said just a coincidence that he decided to do that today okay so let's celebrate that and let's take the torch uh, towards the future uh, of the fantastic work that he has done Thank you all. Just cocktail, celebrate, party. Um.